this way, make your way. We'll get going here and then we'll get to the door prizes and, and we'll be done. Thank you for coming. Uh, let's give the cooks a hand and the workers. kinds of food bagged up for you but uh, we'll do that at the very end on, on your way out okay I want to introduce our speaker tonight and if you would please uh, listen to what he has to say intently uh, this is a friend of mine he's a pastor from Holland Michigan out west Lighthouse Baptist Church in Holland Michigan he's been there for 20 years his name is Bart Spencer First time he came to my church, I called him Bart Simpson. I him. Oh, no. So I haven't done that until tonight. <laughs> He's a good man of God. He got a great work he started there years ago. It's lively. Got a good meeting, good meetings over there. And uh, he served in the uh, Air Force for us. He's a veteran. We appreciate all our veterans. Yes. Veteran. that he's here tonight. He brought his wife Sue along and he's preaching for us tomorrow. So it's an honor to have the preacher stay over and minister to our people. But again, we're glad you're here tonight. And without uh, further ado, we're going to have Mark come and present what he has on his heart tonight. So if you wouldn't mind turning around and listening intently, we'd appreciate it. Okay, Brother Mark, good to have you. Let's get my hand. I did my first muley hunt out there, and it was about 30 degrees from being 25 below. I mean, it was freezing out there. And so we go out, and you mentioned Bart being an odd name. There was another guy on staff. I was an assistant pastor out there. After I, was, I spent nine years in the military, and then my last duty station was at Malmstrom Air Force Base out in Great Falls. And so we go out to hunt. Well, when you hunt out there, uh, you hunt for subsistence. You hunt to live out there. It's a way of life. And uh, so uh, we go out, and another guy on staff, his name is Bart, and he had been hunting out there for quite a while, and I was new, so uh, I go out with him. So you would figure, wouldn't you figure, a guy had been hunting out there all them years, had at some point in time field dressed a deer. You would think that. Well, so, okay, well, now I set that up because here comes the story. So, a buddy of mine, I didn't even have a long rifle out there, so a buddy of mine loads his Ot-6, pump action Ot-6, I'd never even shot it, and we're going out hunting, right? So, we jump these deer, there's, and there's no woods out there. The last tree after Oregon is like Kalispell, and then there's nothing until Minnesota. It's just flat, man. There ain't nothing out there. You know what I'm talking about? And so we were hunting flat ground with just coolies and horse weed, and that's about it. And so we jump this herd deer. There, there's maybe a dozen of them. And I draw on, I had a, a, a doe tag. I, I draw on this muley doe, and, and I pull off on her, and I hit her in the hip. Right? Well, then she goes down into this horse weed, and you can't see her. So I come around on this little little uh, coulee ridge, and I jump her. And God is my witness, she's not the third table away from me. And I pull on her. Boom! Boom! Like, what in the world? Boom! I missed that deer four times from 30 feet away from her. Missed her. And all of a sudden, I hear, Scoot. And there's Brother Bart, about 200 yards behind me, pulling his 270, and poof, drops her. So I said, now, if we get back to church, all people need to know is Bart shot that deer. Because <laughs> right? I shot it, he killed it, but they don't need to know all that. You just leave it right there at Bart. So we get up, I mean, it's freezing, dude, it's freezing. And so we start to, to get this thing, I said, now, now, Bart, we don't have a bone saw, and so, so we're going to get this thing, now, what do we do next? He looks at me like, well, I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? Then you've been out hunting. Anybody ever watch a cable show, uh, Street Shooting with Chad? You guys ever seen that? No. You know, have you seen it? You might write it down. That's my pastor's <coughs> son who has that TV program called Straight Shooting with Chad. Take a look at it. He got some great footage on there. 
So that's who Bart would go hunting with. So he had that. So here we are, two completely green horns trying to gut this deer in the middle, and absolutely freezing cold. You can't feel your hands, and so you know we got it. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Got to cut around, and get things loose. So you can pull them out. We're figuring. We don't know how to do it. We're figuring. So I said, the apex of humility is your. 400 miles in the middle of nowhere on this guy's 7,000 acre ranch. You got this dead deer, and all you got are numb hands and a handful of deer poop. Hey, man, that's all you got in there. Is that all right to say that here? Already said it now, didn't I? Hey, man. Better to ask forgiveness than permission. Hey, man. All right. But the whole idea is that we all want to have something like this hanging on our walls, don't we? We want to bag us a buck. That's the whole purpose of going out there is to bag a buck, you know, and so we, we have people help us out. A lot of people will, you know, and I know in Indiana and Ohio and Michigan, there are certain areas that you can bait, right? Has any guys ever baited for deer before? Uh, what did you use back there in the back for bait? You use corn? What's somebody else use? Carrots. Apples. Carrots, apples. Sugar beets. Sugar beets. What's that? Hand grenades. Hand grenades. That'll get them, buddy. I guarantee you. 50% kill rate within 10 meters. I remember that from my military days. Yes, sir. Rabbit pellets. Rabbit pellets? Are you serious? I have never heard of that. Rabbit pellets. Beets? You may use beets. Beets yeah. is a real popular word. Molasses mash. Huh? Molasses smash. mash. You don't drink it, do you? No. <laughs> hey, I wasn't always a Christian, eh, man? <laughs> Not where I come from, they squeeze that stuff. <laughs> All right. Good. Let me ask you so why do you use bait? To draw them in. To draw them in. Because, hey, hey, you don't get racks like this from having stupid deer, right? No. Uh, they know what they're... And so they're smart, so you got to draw them out to a place of vulnerability, right? And so you find a place like when you go put up a deer stand. You're not putting it up in the parking lot of Walmart, <laughs> right? You're going to find a place that, you're put, that you can draw those deer out into a place of vulnerability. Why? So we're going to bait them so we can bag them. Yep. Right? That's the whole purpose. We're going to bait them so we can bag them. I want you to listen to something. In the book of James in the New Testament, back toward the book of the Revelation, the book of James chapter 1, verse 13, it says this, Let no man say when he is tempted, baited. When he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. That would be another sin for sin. Neither tempteth he any man. So when you're getting baited, we'll get into this in just a second, that's not coming from God. That evil, that sin, that's not coming from God. But there is a purpose behind that baiting. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now those are two fishing terms. I fish a lot more than I hunt. There's nothing better than a ticked off largemouth bass. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Like you get out there bright and early that morning and woo, somebody spit his Wheaties. Man, if you got that buzz bait coming across, boom! Man, you can't hardly stand yourself, huh? You ain't even got, man, you barely get in there. You're like, woo, glory to God! God. You know what I'm talking about. If you've been fishing, you know what I'm talking about. Don't look at me like that. Like this guy. Yeah. If you don't know, you ain't saved until you caught a large amount of bass. <laughs> You'd be one of those, everybody else be going in that gate of heaven. You ought to be standing outside. I got a catch. <laughs> but every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, that means it has a relationship with something else. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. That's the child of lust, is sin. And sin, when it is finished or full grown, completed, bringeth forth death. Then he says this, do not err, do not err. He says, beloved brother, do not err. Don't take it lightly. Don't mistake the fact that there's some baiting for the purpose of bagging going on. 
Well, we look at this situation. What's that got to do with me? You know, you see these deer and up there, and man, there's some nice mounts up there too. You know, at one time, man, they was living large, wasn't they? Okay. Man, they was sharp. Man, everything was going good until that one faithful day that somebody must have been baiting them or somebody was putting them in a position to where they would be vulnerable. You're not going to shoot through a bunch of trees to try to hit one of them, are you? You're going to wait until you can get them out with a good side shot, good broad side shot, and you're right there, and you're either squeezing a trigger or you're drawing a bow, one or the other. But that deer has moved into a place of vulnerability. The practice was necessary. And practice of enticing your hunt into your killing field, your killing range. We have an enemy that's doing the same thing for us today. Bait works because simply this, animals like it. I mean, you're not going to go out and bait a deer. He said rabbit pellets. I, I still, that's first time. That's so foreign to my thought, man. That's unique, man. But, the, but you're not going to bait a deer with chicken liver, right? Because they ain't going to eat it. They're not interested in that. You're not going to, well, uh, I don't know, you're going to bait a deer with, with um, I don't know, whatever kind of weird stuff could be out there. Payday candy bars, I don't know. But you're not going to be going to bait them with something that they like. Something that entices them. Something that when they get a, uh, the wind in just the right direction, they smell it, or they get in that area. And it entices them. It draws them away from a position of safety. And not only that, it distracts them. You know, you can bait those deer. I think you got a minimum of, you got to be wider than a 10 by 10 area if you're going to bait them. And you got to spread it out a little bit. But you get those deer brought out, and he gets distracted. A Mr. Smart Guy never even take, takes time to consider that, man, that bait wasn't there. Those beets, those rabbit pellets, they weren't there yesterday. Why are they here today? But see, it's something that they like, and so they get distracted, and they don't even pay attention to the danger that is awaiting them right there. They get so focused on the pleasure of the moment, they don't have to work for their food, Man, it's been laid right out for them. They can have all that pleasure without any consequence to it. And they walk themselves right out, don't they? That's the purpose behind that bait. Our enemy is baiting us. So he can get us drawn out into a place of vulnerability. And so he can hang our head on the charred walls of hell one day. You see, we have a hunter from hell. That's searching us out. He's searching you out. He's been baiting you with some things, some tempting things. Huh? Yeah, you know how you've been struggling at home in your marriage? You know why? You've been baited. He's baiting you. He's getting you drawn out into a place of vulnerability that he can destroy you. But before he destroys you, he wants to destroy everything you've got. Listen, we've got an enemy, friend. Amen. And we need to understand that. <laughs> that stuff's been laid out there for us for a purpose. That hunter from hell. His choice of baits, not apples or grains or beets or rabbit pellets. <laughs> but the Bible tells us that he tempts us, he baits us with the evil. Evil is any activity that goes against God's Word. Let me ask you this. Is God for drinking whiskey? No. So He baits us with that. I was up till 1.30 uh, morning the other day uh, with, with a good, good young fella that's been baited and captured by liquor. That didn't come from God. God tempts no man with evil. God can't be tempted with evil. And he's not tempted you. So when that evil comes into your life, rest assured that's not coming from God. Amen. Amen. He tempts us with drugs. A big thing now, of course, is, is prescription meds. Some of you may be in here today hooked on prescription meds. That didn't come from God, friend. <laughs> There's a temptation. A baiting has been done for you to try to destroy you. Immorality. 
Pornography? Used to be you used to have to go to the movie theater. Now you don't have to, do you? Talk to me. Amen. Now you don't have to, do you? Amen. And he's baiting it. That hunter from hell is baiting you to destroy your marriage. Amen. To destroy your purity. Amen. Young folks, be listening to that. Amen. You young fellas, be listening to that. You think, oh, wow, that's pleasurable. Well, yeah, for a season. Amen. It destroys your mind, yep. destroys your purity, and you will be unable to love the life of your youth when that time that's comes. That's right. Amen. Because you were baited. Yep. Why do you suppose those activities are so popular? Because sin's fun. Come on, man. He ain't going to hate. That hunter from hell is not going to bait us with boiled spinach. Come on, man. Dude, does anybody like boiled spinach? Oh, brother. Pray for our dear brother Neil we're in shirt. Uh, they have to have an intervention or something. Well, I go down to I can remember being in grade school in Bethany, Illinois. 1,200 people. Salute, amen. And so I remember going down the lunch line and they take this big bunch of green snot and throw it on your plate. What is that? It's boiled spinach. It's good for you. Yeah. Good for the garbage bag because that's right where I went to. I took the jello, I stuck it on top of that spinach, and then just stuffed it away. He ain't going he to tip you with that. He's not going to tip you with a calculus test. Amen. No, ain't nobody likes that stuff, and if you do, you're strained. <laughs> he's not going to tempt us with that. He's going to tempt us with something that's pleasurable. Right. right. Something that's fun. You know that first drink. Ain't one of you liked it when you took it, but you thought it was cool, and you thought I got to be like one of the dudes or the dudettes, and I you know I got I got to get me a snort of that. <laughs> Yeah, and, and one thing led to another. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, and it didn't show you that. It did it. No, it didn't show you that on the poster. <coughs> Everybody was happy, go lucky. Man, do you want to have a life like this? You just get you some of this and throw it back a couple of times. You'll be okay. <laughs> then to show you how it's destroyed your family. Right. Then to show you that your wife is calling the preacher at 1230 in the morning. Right. Didn't show you that, did it? You've been baited. <coughs> You think back to your life. Nothing good has ever come of that sin that you partook of. Not one, not one good thing has ever come from that sin. Amen. Sin is fun. And that's why he uses it. But it's for a purpose. Remember why we baited things? So we could bag them. That's the whole purpose behind it. Huh? We don't go out there for exercise. But I was listening all the way up here to Laugh USA. And it was funny to talk about a guy taking his wife hunting. It was the funniest thing. I, was, I, I could not help but laugh. He says, man, I'm all candied up. Man, everything's looking good. It's bright early in the morning. Here comes my wife. I'm going to take her with me hunting for the first time. She comes out with a yellow jogging suit on. <laughs> carrying her purse. <laughs> He told that story. It was the funniest thing. He said, there we are, 5 o'clock in the morning, crisp. You could hear the squirrels running across the dry leaves. Beautiful morning. Then all of a sudden, I hear it behind me. Oh. It was my wife. She says, Bill, what are we doing? Or when? Oh, when do they come? I'm not listening to this. When do they come? I don't know. I didn't get the invitation. <laughs> Big old Buck comes out from me. He goes, oh, man, this is him. I can't wait. She goes, oh, isn't he cute? He looks like Bambi's dad. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> he said, why do you think I brought the gun? Is it to protect us? You're going to kill it? Run, dear, run! <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't turn that gun on her. <laughs> <laughs> You're a trophy. You're a trophy that is pursued yep. by the hunter of hell. Yep. I was in Montana, had a guy get a Boone and Crockett elk, bull elk, and didn't want to saw the horns to put it in his house. He built a room 
unto his house around the mount. No. I'm, God is my witness. How expensive a hunt was that? Talk to me. Yeah, spent a couple hundred dollars for a tag, get some ammo. Then he's got $40,000 or addition on the house. Amen. Just because it didn't want saw marks on his antlers. Man. There's a trophy. Trophy for him. You see, the hunter from hell has baited you with sin for the purpose of taking you to his place. You see, God didn't create hell for you. He created hell for the devil and his angels. But that hunter from hell is baiting you so he can take you where he is. Hey, he's not the captain of hell. He's suffering down here with everybody else. But he's baiting you so he can get you. Before. Now, this is what happens. Now, I'm going to wrap this thing up right here. He's baited you. You stepped out into a place of vulnerability. He's got you right where he wants you. You don't even recognize it. You think life is going great. But you don't know that your one trigger pole or one bow pole, you do one bow draw on it, and you're right in his shooting killing field, and you're that close away from it. But God has done something for you. I'm going to illustrate. I wasn't sure if I was going to. I think I'm going to. And Jeremiah, could you come and help me? My brother, could you come up here a second? I told him so. I said, I may use you, I may not. I'm not sure, but I think the Lord would have us to do it. I just want to illustrate what Jesus has done for you. And you're going to have to use your imagination because this is Jesus. All right? There's a lot of them This is a lost sinner. That was easy to figure out. <laughs> He's the assistant pastor uh, here at the church. So. And, and, uh, and so what's happened is you've gone on in your life. You've been going on in your life. And you're not thinking nothing about it. It's all good. Everything's happy. Everything's fine. Peachy king. Yeah, cotton's high. Everything's good. Yeah. But you'll realize you're right in his crosshairs. And he's getting ready to draw on you. He's getting ready to squeeze on you. And you have no idea it's coming. But at the moment when you need it at most, this is what happened. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned and are in the crosshairs of the hunter from hell. Listen to me. We're drawing down to an end now. Crosshairs of the hunter from hell. But the Bible says this. He says, while we were yet sinners, Christ did something for us. And the Bible says it. Never mind. Can I step over here just a second? I'll take this way. And just about that time that we were going to be lost for eternity in hell, Somebody stepped in front. Go ahead and step up. In front of us. And the Lord Jesus Christ stepped in front and took what you and I rightly deserve. Uh, you know why he did that? Because the Bible says God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to step in your place to take the penalty, the punishment from the hunter of male that you rightly deserve. Amen. But he died for you. Thank you, fellas. You can be seated. And he died for you. Yep. Now the question is, what are you going to do about it? See, a lot of us, we'll step around. Christ died for us. Christ right there to take our punishment for us. We're like, no, man, I got this thing. Yep. It's all good. I'm a man. I can handle my own thing. Can you now, big shot? Yeah. We ain't talking about here. We're talking about eternity. Amen. This Amen. is an eternal debt that has to be paid. And Jesus stepped in front, listen to me, to die for your sin. I was 22 years old before I knew that. I was not raised as a Christian. My grandfather, at 20 years of age, my grandfather gave me as a 20-year-old man, he gave me a gospel track right there. That gospel track said, the first line in that track says this, I'm asking you the most important question of your life, your joy or your sorrow for all eternity depends upon your answer. I was a cop. In the military, were cruise missile units, and I, I knew I was missing something. Amen. And that's a lot of you here today. You know, there's something inside you're missing. You can't put your finger on it, but way deep down, where no X-ray or MRI can get to, there's an unsettledness in your soul. What that is called? That's called the wooing or the drawing of the Holy Spirit. There's chaos, there's confusion, there's an uncertainty. You know there's got to be something more to life than what you've got. Amen. And you don't know what it is. Amen. Lord, what am I missing? I've been there. And at 1121 Barksdale, Grissom Air Force Base, Kokomo, Indiana, in November 1984, 
two weeks after having a cater for a friend of mine who was a cop, I had 30 drunken cops in my house. And I thought, you know, there's got to be something more to life than this. Amen. And two weeks later, I pulled that track out of my wallet and read it. Changed my life. Amen. Changed my life. Amen. You know why? Because I realized Jesus <laughs> had died for me. Amen. And if I would accept him as my Savior, then the wrath of God would no longer be on me, but it was transferred to Jesus. Amen. And God took the righteousness, the perfection of Jesus, and gave it to me and took my sin and placed it on His Son. He will save your soul today if you'll allow Him. How long does it take? That quickly. Amen. Been there, done it. I know exactly what I'm talking about. Amen. I looked at that prayer in there. I know it's not a prayer that saves you. It's a decision of the heart. Amen. But we use the word pray. That simply means talk to God. I didn't know how to talk to God. I never prayed before. But I read that prayer in that track. And I'll tell you what, I got on my knees because on TV that's what they did when they prayed. And I got up off my knees after praying that prayer. And I can remember letting out an audible sigh in my living room at 1121 Barksdale going, Whew, something just happened. I had no idea what it was. I had no idea. But my wife comes home. We only had one child at the time. My wife comes home and I pour my liquor down the sink. I never went to church. I had no preacher tell me that. And, and, and people say, well, I just ain't convicted of it. You're liar, liar, pants on fire. Catch your pants on electric wire. <laughs> you get born again, you get convicted of it. Amen. Amen. Uh, amen. Not that it saved right. you in your sin. He saves you out of your yeah, sin. Amen. That's right. I ask you today, are you willing today to come to Christ? Amen. Are you willing? He has paid the ultimate price mm -hmm. to save your soul from hell. Amen. But he's waiting for you to accept that. He did it on your behalf. Amen. Will you come to Him today? Let's bow our heads, close our eyes just for a moment. Father, I'm asking You now to work in the hearts of these men and women. Yes, Lord. Lord, I thank You for their attentiveness tonight. What an honor it's been to present Your Gospel plan before them. Now, Lord, just as You've done with all those folks, I think they're in the Sermon on the Mount, at the very end, you gave them a chance to respond. And so, Father, I'm giving them a chance, just following your lead. And so, Lord, I need you to do what only you can do. Bring the conviction to their heart right now. The fact that they are guilty, condemned, they've been baited by the devil and not even realizing it. But God, I pray that you'd save them tonight before it's everlasting too late. Lord, you said you've done everything for us. And then you said, whosoever will may come and take of the water of life freely. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Father, please work with our heads bowed and eyes closed. You're here tonight. You say, preacher, I listen to what you have to say. I know that I'm guilty. I fought it off and I've tried to downplay it. I've turned the radio, turned off the TV when people talk about it. and I've tried to run from it all these years. Preacher, tonight I understand it's time to stop running and I need to accept what Jesus has done for me. Preacher, I want Jesus tonight as my personal Savior. Would you pray with me? Friend, listen to me. I, I would never embarrass you in a thousand lifetimes. But I want to help you. You're here tonight. You say, Preacher, when you pray in just a moment, would you pray for me? I need Christ as my Savior. Friend, I will. I'll not point you out. I'll not come back to you. But will you acknowledge by a lifted hand that you're in need of Jesus tonight? Would you raise your hand right there and say, Preacher, that's me. I need Christ as my Savior tonight. And I'm not ashamed to raise my hand. God bless you. I see that hand down there in the middle. On the way back, you can put it down. I see that hand on my left. Are there others? No one looking around now. I see that on my left. Halfway back, three quarters of the way back, you can put it down. Anybody else? I see that hand on my left. I see that one. Yes. Are there others? I'm going to give you just a few more seconds.
to determine your eternal destiny. What about it? Are you ready to come to Christ tonight? Right now, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Just those people that raise their hand. I want you to look up here at me. Just those people that raise their hand. Look up here at me. Do you mean that? Are you ready to receive Christ as your Savior? Are you ready for that? What I want to do is I'm going to have a word of prayer with you. You're going to pray quietly as I pray aloud. And I want to help you to receive Christ as your personal Savior. Okay? Christians, you can be praying now. Perhaps there's others here that did not raise their hand, but you say, Preacher, I want that. Then you can pray quietly as I pray aloud a prayer that goes something like this. Dear God, I know I've sinned, and I'm sorry for that. I deserve hell, but the best way I know how, I'm receiving Jesus as my personal Savior. I'm turning from my old life. And I'm turning to you tonight. Right now, I give you my life. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life and save me. With heads bowed and eyes closed, you say, Preacher, I prayed with you right then. I've accepted Jesus tonight as my Savior, and I'm not ashamed of that. Would you raise your hand right now? I can thank God for you. You raise your hand or I can see it. God bless you. I see that on my left. On my left also, I see those. See, they're in the center. You can put your hand down. Are there others? Yes, I see that in the back. How about yourself? Father, I thank you for the time together. I thank you for the opportunity to present the gospel. Father, we are now without excuse. We all, everyone within earshot of my voice knows the gospel message. And we're held responsible for that. So God, continue to work on those who are, have not trusted Christ. Those who will walk out of here yet condemned within the crosshairs of the evil one. God, work on their heart tonight. God, would you tonight just make them miserable as they go to bed that they can't get that off their heart. I know some have talked a little bit while I've been preaching to try to get their mind off it and try to distract others. And that's all right. But God, I know you're greater than that distraction. God, work in the lives of these dear folk. Thank you for this place, for, for the Brown, for the Bard, and all the effort that's gone into this time tonight. God, please work in the lives of these folk in Jesus' name. Amen.